Okay, we're getting close to the end of the day and drinks and canapes, so I'll try to keep on time. Um, so uh, there's probably some people in the audience that have already guessed who George is, and there's probably several that are wondering who George is. Uh, George is George de Hevesy. So he was a physicist, um, did um, amazing uh, work in the first half of last century, and I think he can be uh, considered the father of nuclear medicine in, in many respects. So he invented or, or developed the tracer technique. <clears throat> and it's the tracer technique or tracer principle on which uh, nuclear medicine, uh, everything that we do in nuclear medicine rests. Uh, so he uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1943 for this, for this work. Um, and that's him there at the end of the second row over on, on the right. Uh, and he was a PhD student of Marie Curie. So that's Marie Curie sitting over on the, on the far left. And she's sitting next to her, Ernest Rutherford, Sir Ernest Rutherford, uh, famous New Zealand ph physicist. Uh, and it was in his lab in Cambridge that George de Hevesy uh, discovered uh, and developed the tracer technique. So George's uh, instrument of choice was the Geiger-Müller counter, um, which in fact is a very sensitive radiation detection instrument. And after he'd done his uh, foundational work in Cambridge, he set up his own lab in Copenhagen and he did some of the most extensive and exquisite uh, tracer studies in animals and plants. And in this case, I'm showing um, a measurement of phosphorus 32 in, in the blood uh, of, uh, of rabbits. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful data set. You can see there's a really nice signal to noise there. And these were uh, yeah, pioneering studies. Uh, of course, we have um, a new instrument that we can use to do tracer studies, the total body PET. Uh, and Simon and others have already talked about the capability of this system to measure uh, dynamics at very high sensitivity in the, the whole uh, body, which is which is uh, very impressive, of course. And and Simon also showed um, a dynamic study. This is this is also a data set here from UC Davis that was kindly lent to me by by Ramsey, which I think again just just to remind us just how exquisite this data is and how unique it is, showing the distribution, the time varying distribution of FDG. Uh, in, in the body. And essentially what you're looking at there is, um, is the exact same type of data that George was measuring in the blood of a rabbit, except that we're measuring it, as Simon said, in every single voxel in the human body and at exquisitely high sensitivity. So it sort of begs the question, what would George do if, if he had access to, to such an instrument? And, um, and so... Uh, my short answer to this, this question is, of course, he would do dynamics. And, um, and so I'm going to try and reinforce the point that, I, that Simon was making earlier on. Uh, and, and I will come to a more slightly nuanced answer uh, towards the end of my talk. And fortunately, Simon and others have already explained very nicely the difference between static imaging and dynamic imaging. So I don't need to go through that. So this is your typical... Uh, clinical protocol, static protocol, where we uh, acquire a five-minute scan and produce an SUV image. In dynamic imaging, of course, we're injecting the tracer in the scanner and capturing the, uh, the dynamic changing uh, tracer distribution over time. So why would we want to do that? Why would that be useful? Well, this is, a, I think, a really nice clinical example of, of why there's information in those dynamics that could potentially be very useful uh, clinically. This was from um, a very large series of, of published whole body dynamic studies uh, that came out of the Turku Center. And this is a patient who um, has uh, disease as an FDG scan. There's disease there in the mediastinum, but there's also this suspicious lesion in the axillary uh, lymph node here. This is a patient who had received uh, immunotherapy. And so, um, yeah, that looks uh, like there's disease in the lymph nodes. But when you look at the dynamic data and process it and use the sorts of kinetic models that Simon was describing earlier on, 
What that allows you to do is to separate out the metabolic component of the signal from the distribution volume, which is largely dominated by the vascular uh, component. And lo and behold, what you see is that the lesion has completely disappeared from the metabolic image. You only see it in this uh, distribution volume image, suggesting that in fact, it's um, in this case, it's not uh, cancer. It is uh, much more likely to be some kind of uh, an overstimulated immune system creating um, inflammation or, or an, an, uh, a response in the lymph node. So there's really useful information in the dynamic data. And I think Simon also talked about the amount of data uh, we produce. So this is, this is just showing, um, showing the typical workflow for a dynamic scan. Just to, just to say that although there's great information there, there's also a huge challenge. And this is just to put some numbers on that. So if we were to perform uh, a 90 minute dynamic scan on, on our scanner, uh, depending on how much we inject, we would generate up to one terabyte of data. Uh, and that would take about four hours to reconstruct a typical sort of dynamic uh, data set. And we generate up to four billion data points that we have to analyze. If we use nonlinear least squares fitting, that would take up to about 100 hours to process, even on, on really high-end dedicated computing hardware. <laughs> So just keep that in mind. There's, uh, there's a big challenge there in terms of data processing. So what I'd like to do over, just over the next few slides is, is rummage around in our toolbox to see what we've got that can help us to analyze this dynamic data and how it might somehow help people like uh, Andrew and, and Ollie answer the questions that they're interested in. Uh, so the question is, have we got the data analysis tools um, and are they the right tools? So, um, so we'll take a little bit of a, a, a look through this. Um, and fortunately, again, Simon has, has done uh, me a favour by introducing a lot of these topics, so I'll, I'll move reasonably quickly. So we've got standard compartmental models. You've seen those in other talks today. If we were using a conventional scan or just imaging the brain, we would uh, use this well-understood two-tissue compartment model. And because we need to also know the trace of concentration in arterial blood, we would take arterial blood samples throughout the PET scan. So it's a total body PET. Fortunately, we don't have to do that. It's the heart's in the field of view. So that's, that's, uh, that makes our life easier. And from that data, as, as Simon showed, you can generate a parametric image representing uh, KI, which is a quantitative parameter that reflects the metabolic rate. It's a quantitative physiological parameter. The problem, you know, at least one of the problems, is that that model works well in the brain, but it doesn't work well in, for example, the liver, where we have a dual blood supply and we have a lot of metabolites, a lot of metabolism going on, and it probably doesn't work well in the gut either, where we similarly have a dual blood supply. So the question is, which model do we use? These techniques don't automatically lend themselves to heterogeneous kinetics. So that's one problem. Um, I'll show you a couple of potential solutions to that. So we, we have another technique called spectral analysis that's been used for a long, long time. It um, does have the advantage that it doesn't make any assumptions about the number of um, tissue compartments. So that's good. And it also potentially allows for those different uh, input functions that, that I mentioned. Although I'm not aware of anyone having, having actually tested that. Then we have these Bayesian approaches. This is something uh, my group's been playing with for, uh, for a while recently with our, our colleagues at CSIRO and UNSW. And the advantage of these techniques is that they allow you to test multiple competing models and, and it selects the most appropriate model based on the data. And it also gives you uncertainty about both the, the model selection and the model parameters. Um, so I might just skip over the, um, uh, this part just to say that the, the technique rests on, on Bayes' rule. But what I did want to show you is the data set on the right. Again, this is a dynamic total body pet data set from, uh, this is from Simon's colleague, Guabao Wang at UC Davis. 
And what we did here was to get this technique we, and uh, process this data, and we asked it to, to test two competing models in this data set. And the two competing models are one where the, uh, where we're assuming the kinetics are irreversible, and the other where we assume that the data are reversible, which are shown as the red boxes here. Um, so this reversibility relates to the rate constant Simon mentioned much earlier on, the K4, which is typically very small. So just showing that we can analyze heterogene heterogeneous kinetics in the whole body, and we're really keen to explore this technique further. But the problem is that we're still treating these time activity curves as indiv individual independent uh, measurements. And we know they're not, they're not independent. Um, and so I think especially to answer some of these questions that Andrew's interested in, Ollie's interested in, we need to look at uh, the, the correlations and the associations between these dynamic data uh, points in different parts of the body. And uh, this is um, uh, a, a technique that's uh, really um, Shana and, and Gary Egan have, have, have been leading the charge on, which is to take uh, a technique called um, connectivity that's been well tested and validated with fMRI and structural MRI data, diffusion MRI data, and see if we can apply it to PET data. And so what you're looking at here is a connectivity or a, a, yeah, a connectivity matrix um, looking at how the, uh, the data, the, the kinetic data are correlated between different organs in the body, but in this case, based on uh, PET kinetics. And you get that, uh, those correlations from uh, the residuals here after you've uh, fitted the, uh, the data with a model. So, um, so this is a really interesting <coughs> approach, and I think there's a lot of value in it. Um, but I, I also think it doesn't quite go far enough in the sense that it's 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 still looking at associations rather than uh, the the, uh, the mediators of signalling, which is which is what we're most interested in when we want to study brain body connections. So for that, I think we need to turn to other techniques that look more directly. Um, at the mediators of signaling, receptors, transporters, neurotransmitters. Uh, and you need to use uh, techniques like the one that my colleague, my collaborator Evan is, is rocking on his T-shirt mm -hmm. here. I don't expect you'll be able to read what's on his T-shirt, but it basically says that the world according to Evan uh, is, uh, and this is, this is the dopamine part of the world and this is everything else. So um, these techniques allow you not only to uh, study um, in the sort of activation experiments Dale was talking about, but now we're looking at um, neurotransmitter responses. So they allow you to do that. They allow you to characterize the neurotransmitter signal in terms of timing, magnitude, shape, uh, and interrogate, interrogate uh, drug effects. The problem is, and I think I will skip over this slide because we're um, just in the interest of time, um, so, you know, we've applied these techniques very successfully in learning paradigms in the rat brain. So this is an awake uh, rat having a PET scan. Um, this is uh, the dopamine response we're able to measure based on that model that Evan was, was showing um, in an activation experiment. And this is the behavioural data on the, on the right here. And Evan has used the exact same technique and his colleagues to study the brains of smokers having smoking a cigarette in the PET scan. And the interesting thing there was that they found gender differences in terms of the, the actual dopamine response to cigarette smoking. So um, I've rushed through that rather quickly, but the point um, that I wanted to make is we can, with these techniques, we can directly probe signaling between the brain and other organs, but they've never been tested outside the brain. So that's obviously an area that that we could explore. So coming back to what would George do, um, of course he would do he would do dynamics. Um, I think also if he was here today, he would really encourage us to fully exploit the unique capabilities of total body pet. He would encourage us to be bold and adventurous. Um, of course we've got to look at the low hanging fruit, but there are lots of really challenging and interesting problems to study as well. 
And he would say, don't stand still. The technique itself, total body PET and the methods of data analysis are going to have to be further developed to answer the sorts of questions that we're, we're being asked. Uh, and so I just want to finish with um, a quote from George. So this was something that he said in his Nobel acceptance uh, lecture. Uh, and he said, the most remarkable result obtained in the study of the application of isotopic indicators is perhaps the discovery of the dynamic state of the body constituents. Um, in a, and in a little um, piece of, of happy coincidence, he said this on this exact day, uh, 79 years ago. So I'll leave you there with, uh, with my acknowledgement slide. Thanks for your attention.